it's really a, a privilege to be here at the uh, uh, workshop on uh, knowledge representation for, uh, for hybrid and, and compositional AI, I think is, is the full name. Um, so I really wanna, wanna thank the organizers for having me here today uh, to talk about a, uh, a topic that I'm particularly passionate about, which is how we can use symbolic representations such as knowledge graphs uh, as, uh, as scaffolds to be able to, to structure the capabilities of neural reasoning systems. Uh, so let's dive right in. Um, so to start off, I, I kind of want to give a, a, a bit of background about, about my motivations. Um, my ultimate goal is to be able to design machines that can uh, mimic the way that humans reason about situations uh, when, they, when they arrive at an understanding of them. Uh, and that can be you know, really simple problems, such as uh, this, this example from the Winograd schema. Uh, the trophy would not fit uh, in the brown suitcase because it was too big, what was too big, uh, being able to, to, to understand some, some type of fit function between these two objects to come to the conclusion that it's the trophy uh, that's too big, um, but also to much more complex narratives. Uh, so perhaps if I tell you that it's gonna snow, so I'm gonna have to, to wake up 30 minutes earlier, uh, even with this very limited narrative, uh, each of us is, is, is able to produce um, and, and really make a lot of inferences that fill in the gap uh, for making these two statements coherent. Uh, so maybe if, if you have children, you have to get them dressed for the cold, wet weather, which might take a while. If you have a car, you have to clear the windshield, heat it up, potentially dig it out. Um, if you take public transportation, that might be its own, its own problem with inclement weather. Uh, so even though these two sentences appeared completely unrelated at first, you know, we're able to think about the unstated implications uh, to understand you know, just the information that's presented in a, in a coherent manner. And so really the, the big question is how can we get you know, machine systems uh, to be able to understand language the same way that we do? And so I'm gonna, I'm gonna posit that there's two very high level challenges to being able to, to do this effectively. Uh, the first is being able to represent uh, machine common sense knowledge uh, at scale, uh, which is you know quite 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 a quite a challenge on its own, as I'm sure we all know. Seeing as you know the scale of knowledge in an open world is is absolutely uh, tremendous. Uh, so the number of things that we know and and are able to to rely on uh, in order to, to 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 make inferences, draw conclusions about the world is is truly incredible. Uh, you know it. it, it it ranges from things such as you take a basketball and, 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 and let go of it, it's going to drop to the ground unless there's something to hold it up. Uh, but also knowing what types of blunt objects you can use to push a nail through a piece of wood or knowing how to interact in different social situations. So we really use all of these types of information uh, to, to understand and operate in the situations that we encounter. And when we read language, we're able to kind of relate what we have through our own experiences to these same types uh, of situations. And even if we're, you know, uh, even if we never think about these individual facts on their own, we're able to recollect them all the time to be able to describe them to someone else. Um, and these questions of, of, of representation are, are, are quite relevant for the second kind of major challenge that we face uh, is that, you know, once we actually have a suitable knowledge representation, such as a large knowledge base of knowledge, you know, how can we actually teach machines to, to, to be able to use that knowledge effectively uh, for arriving and understanding these situations. Uh, so, you know, in the example that I described earlier, as humans, we were easily able to identify multiple coherent narratives that are able to connect these two sentences together. Uh, but for a machine to be able to do the same thing, uh, you know, that would require kind of, you know, multiple stages. The first is, you know, being able to identify which pieces of knowledge might be relevant in the first place. Uh, particularly amongst a, a, a large amount of other noisy or irrelevant knowledge for the situation that is available uh, to grab from uh, to be able to, to arrive at an understanding. Uh, and then the second thing is how do we actually connect these pieces of knowledge together to get to the correct understanding of the situation that we're faced with? Um, well, you know, unfortunately, despite the incredible advances uh, of the last few years in, in, in kind of you know, neural network systems and, and deep learning, uh, this is exactly the type of behavior that these large scale systems you know, trained on, 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 on extreme scale data uh, really struggle with. Uh, in general, even though they, they learn very powerful representations to be able to, to accomplish a lot of tasks we give them, uh, when we actually you know, you know, put them towards accomplishing the tasks we want, 
they tend to try and connect the easiest patterns that they can pick up on that'll lead them to the right answer or the right relation or the right conclusion. And they often learn to, to correlate very simple, very simple relationships uh, from their input rather than doing anything more complicated, which is what we would require them to do for, for, for deep reasoning. And so really the issue with neural models is that you know, they can't learn these, these robust reasoning capabilities that we need them to have simply because in many cases uh, that, we, that we apply them to, it's just easier for them to learn to do well on a task by exploiting much simpler patterns. Um, you know, meanwhile, symbolic methods, uh, which you know, often disentangle representation and reasoning in a much more uh, you know, structural and interpretable way, uh, are much better at, at doing this type of complex reasoning uh, that would be required to, to actually uh, find the, uh, the, the meaningful paths uh, through which we actually accomplish uh, the goals we want. Um, however, you know, their shortcoming is that they've historically been a lot more difficult to apply out of the box. Uh, often requiring you know, specialized engineering uh, to be able to function in domain on a, in, a, in, a, in a constrained area that we care about and, and rarely adapting to open worlds uh, in the way that you know, we're, we're easily able to, to at least apply neural models uh, into, even though they, 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 they tend to fail once actually put there. And so the focus of my talk today is really gonna be on how we can tackle this challenge of, of robust common sense reasoning uh, in open settings. Um, and specifically, I'm going to talk about our efforts in the last year at taking some of the most uh, promising ideas of both symbolic AI and neural AI uh, to be able to build uh, expressive and interpretable reasoners uh, over common sense knowledge. And so I'm going to, you know, this talk's going to be divided into three parts. Uh, first, I'll talk about uh, reasoning uh, by imagining different explanations for a phenomenon using dynamic graph constructions uh, from, from neural knowledge models. Uh, and then I'll talk about how we can actually unite uh, kind of real-time extracted knowledge graphs uh, with uh, neural language representations to, to enable joint reasoning over, over both the language and the knowledge modalities. And then finally, if there's some time left, uh, I'll talk about how we can actually create more tightly coupled joint representations between these modalities to get even more expressive reasoning. Um, so let's get started with the, with the first case where we're going to see that we can imagine dy uh, dynamically imagine knowledge graphs for specific situations and then uh, reason over them. Uh, and this is primarily from work that uh, was published at uh, AAAI uh, this year, uh, along with Ronan Lebras and uh, Yejin Choi. Um, and to, to, to kind of uh, start off, I want to take this, this motivating example from the social IQA data set, uh, which is a, uh, a social common sense understanding data set. Um, that uh, provide situational context, such as uh, Kai knew that things were getting out of control and managed to keep his temper in check. Uh, then a question about that context, how would others feel as a result, and a set of possible answers to that question. So uh, things like relieved, scared, uh, or anxious. You know, as humans, if we were to reason about the situation and try to explain what's going on to somebody else, uh, we might imagine uh, a chain of reasoning to reach the conclusion, such as the fact that a distressing situation was developing, but Kai stayed calm and didn't make it any worse. Uh, as a result, that situation did not escalate, which ultimately meant that everybody felt relieved. Uh, and so, you know, in doing this, our actions, our decisions, our predictions that we make based off these concepts uh, can be audited for whether they're well-founded uh, by, you know, looking at whatever reasoning steps we take uh, to arrive at them. Uh, unfortunately, when it comes to, to machines, such as the large class of language models that now uh, dominate most NLP tasks, uh, that's a lot easier said than, than actually modeled. Uh, so as I mentioned previously, you know, neural models don't learn to do this type of reasoning in an easily accessible way, both because they, they lack the inductive bias to represent these reasoning steps, uh, but also because they tend to discover shortcuts uh, to reach the same conclusions without reasoning to the right answer. Um, meanwhile, if we were going to try to do this purely with knowledge graphs and, and symbolic methods, we're going to be you know, quite stimmied in, in terms of trying to find the right representation uh, to represent this context. Uh, so you know, typically what we might have to do is try to search for an explicitly definable reasoning path for that correct answer, perhaps by searching for it in a knowledge graph. Um, but seeing as we'd be unlikely to connect to that knowledge graph directly given the context, uh, you know, we have to you know, develop some type of function to map the closest nodes in the knowledge graph that we can find to the situation uh, to the text that we're reading about. So here, for example, you know, our function might connect to, to, to events within a knowledge graph such as atomic, uh, such as X keeps X's temper, 
and others. Uh, but you know, some of these fragments might already be incorrect. And so that's already introducing new avenues for error. But even, meanwhile, even if we can find the best fragment to actually connect to the situation, so the one that has the best associated inferences that we can make about it, uh, we've lost a lot of that you know, query specific context in the first place. So even though we might be connected to the best available knowledge, um, you know, that knowledge might end up being relevant or, or worse, just, just plain wrong. Uh, and so we're already kind of dealing with an under specification issue here, which is that the knowledge we're able to access might not actually be related to the situation we actually have. Um, and so the challenges that we're ultimately dealing with in, in kind of both of these paradigms are that, you know, one of them, while incredibly high capacity and expressive, uh, doesn't actually learn how to do what we want it to do in the right way. Uh, and the other one, while it can learn what we want it to do in the right way, or be adapted to do what we want it to do in the right way, tends to not have the capacity to actually accomplish the task we're looking for. You know, so what, what type of solutions can we propose to this? Um, so recently, um, in, in work that I'm not going to talk about here, we developed a new class of model called a common sense transformer, uh, which, or Comet for short, or common sense knowledge models, you know, whichever name uh, folks seem to like best, there seems to be a lot of them going around. Uh, but what's important to know about these models is that they pretty much serve as neural representations of knowledge bases. So what these systems do is that they, they exploit the fact that over the course of pre-training, language models learn to implicitly represent a whole lot of knowledge as they read millions, if not billions of, uh, of documents. And so then when you take that pre-trained language model and you proceed to train it on the structure of a knowledge graph, you learn to access uh, implicit knowledge in the model and convert it to a more explicit representation, or at least learn to have the model imagine it in a more explicit way by generating it from its language output distribution. And because the model has an intrinsic understanding of a lot of the concepts uh, that we'd be interested in, in, in learning common sense knowledge about, uh, it's going to be able to generalize the structure that it can now output uh, to a whole lot of concepts that weren't in our seed knowledge graph uh, to begin with. And so with, with a knowledge model such as comets, um, we're actually able to kind of remove a lot of these linking issues to traditional symbolic structures uh, that we have. Uh, with knowledge graphs because it's representing this knowledge base neurally inside a language model and more importantly extending it to a lot of the concepts that the language model had an implicit um, uh, had implicit information about we can now take any entity as input as long as that input is describable by natural language and that's a lot less restrictive than the high level languages that are typically associated with symbolic systems and that means that now we can now generate common sense knowledge for pretty much any context that can be fully parsed by the model and there's no more linking to these static knowledge structures that may or may not have relevant events and may or may not decontextualize the input that we have. The knowledge is now generated dynamically from this neural knowledge model. Um, and so here's what's exciting too, is that if you think about what this common sense transformer model is doing, it's really producing new common sense inferences about this context that we give it. And so we can really treat that context as a root node in a graph and the generated knowledge inferences about that context as new generated nodes that connect to it. And in essence, you're creating a dependency graph uh, of common sense knowledge about this root situation. Um, and, you can, and you can scale up this approach. So then you can take these same events that are generated by this common sense transformer and use it to produce additional inferences that are multiple hops uh, away from the context, which allows you to grow this dependency graph of, of common sense knowledge. And you know, in theory, you could scale this up to an arbitrary number of, of inference hops. So as you move away from the true context node, you might find the knowledge become increasingly less relevant to the original situation. So you kind of be back to the same problems you originally had with decontextualizing your input. Um, and so what's important to do at this point is, is find a way to cap this graph, you know, find the right way of being able to say like, I don't need to do any, any, any further inferences in order to reach a conclusion. Um, and that's where we can actually use different types of pre-initialized conclusions uh, that we're you know, typically trying to, to, to evaluate with respect to one another. You know, it's rare that we're just you know, kind of trying to find an, an open set of decisions that we can make. We usually already have an idea of what types of options we have available, whether it's a set of uh, answer options from a multiple choice QA task or a set of end states that we can potentially try to reach in a decision-making process. Um, and so we can initialize these conclusions as nodes and connect them back to the graph uh, as leaves uh, for, for, for the entire structure. Uh, and in this way, the, the generated nodes that we produce from this common sense transformer uh, become intermediate states in this graph, uh, but the root node is always the context and the leaf nodes are always whatever end state you're actually trying to potentially evaluate. Uh, 
And so in essence, what we've done is that our algorithm constructs this, this local symbolic graphical representation of the world that is grounded in common sense inferences that can be made about the original situation. Uh, and this is quite interesting because we're now moving back and forth between the neural and symbolic representation spaces. We start by embedding a knowledge graph in a neural language model uh, and hope to generalize to many other types of situations to be able to, to, to scale up our common sense representation capabilities in a slightly more structured manner. And now we can use that, uh, that, that, that model to be able to generate these localized symbolic structures for the specific context that we encounter in language. And so now that we've you know, kind of gotten this cool representation scheme, it naturally brings up this question of how we can use these constructed graphs uh, to reason about the, the correct uh, answer. Uh, and so you know, let's use a, a simple example with only two generated nodes between the context and answer choices to, to, to depict this. And let's actually abstract away from what those, uh, those values are, since ultimately what we want to be able to do is, is derive some type of more uh, mathematical formulation for being able to reason over this graph. Um, what we can do once we have this graph structure is actually initialize factors along the edges of this graph uh, that are a reflection of our confidence in the assertions being made. Uh, so for example, given the context C, how confident are we in the common sense inferences G1 and G2? And similarly, given G1, how confident are we in the individual conclusions uh, that could be reached uh, from these points? Uh, so at this point, I'll, I'll point you to the paper if you want to learn more about how we initialize these factors. You know, in this case, you know, we actually use the Comet model itself to be able to produce these, these, these individualized scores, though you could you know, use different methods to do it. Um, but the real important detail is that once you've initialized the factors, you can also uh, do inference uh, over this graph structure uh, to, to, to actually score the different conclusions you can reach from this point. And so we, we played around with, with, with multiple inference methods in the paper. Uh, but as an example, the simplest one you can actually use is to you know, just take the maximum scoring path uh, to the answer from the context. And so aggregate the factors along the path uh, from the context node to each possible uh, conclusion. And then for each conclusion, you can take the highest scoring path. And that'll give you uh, a single score uh, for each for each possible end state uh, with respect to the root node. Uh, and that allows you to select uh, what is the most likely end state uh, that, you should, that you should try to reach uh, given the information that you have about the world that is presented uh, by this graph in the first place. Uh, so to give a, a, a quick recap of what I just discussed, you know, I, I proposed a method where we can actually take raw contexts that are made up of just natural language describing situations without doing kind of any complex parsing uh, to make it fit into a predefined schema. Instead, we, we kind of parse those context, you, contexts using uh, these common sense transformers into these contextual graphs of common sense knowledge. And then once we have these graphs, uh, we can find the right way of producing you know, weighted edges along it in order to be able to perform inference, uh, in, inference over the graphs to, to, to reach a particular conclusion amongst a set of options that we already know ahead of time. Um, and so we, uh, to, to evaluate whether this, this method could work, uh, we apply this method to the task I described earlier, where we're given you know, different contexts and questions about those contexts and have to select a, a likely answer from a set of choices. Uh, and as our neural knowledge base, we used a common sense transformer that was trained on the atomic knowledge graph. And then uh, for our evaluation, we used the social IQA uh, data set, as well as another one called story common sense. Um, and one thing I do want to mention at this point is that I haven't actually talked at all about training uh, this approach uh, because we are actually really trying to simulate the idea that this model, the common sense transformer, is able to learn general knowledge from you know, being trained on the knowledge graph in the first place, but hasn't actually been presented with any data of the same distribution from the task it's trying to do. Remember, we're really trying to avoid the fact that these, these language models, when fine-tuned on a particular task, can just learn to exploit the simplest patterns that they can uh, to arrive at a particular conclusion. So we're actually not updating any particular model here based off the data sets that we're using as evaluation. And we're also not tuning any hyperparameters on the development sets uh, of these data sets. We're really trying to see whether the knowledge that we can get and the graphical structures we create you know, can be reasoned over without any type of additional training to actually do well on the task. Uh, and we're going to compare this to other zero-shot approaches, such as using pre-trained language models to score the options with respect to the contexts, you know, using uh, language priors that are encoded by these models. Um, and so we ran this study uh, on these two data sets, and the main uh, takeaways are uh, twofold. Uh, 
Uh, the first is that, you know, in general, you know, using this type of approach gets better performance than other unsupervised uh, baselines, such as large parameter language models, as well as, you know, more complex ways of evaluating uh, these types of situations using large parameter language models, such as the self-talk framework from uh, Schwartz et al. at EMNLP 2020. Um, and the second is that, you know, knowledge adaptation uh, to be able to, to actually uh, model these situations is more efficient than just blindly scaling these language models to, to, to added heights. Um, you know, so our dynamic construction, uh, graph construction model has uh, as many parameters as the GPT-2 medium language model, uh, but when we double the size of the model to GPT-2 large, we don't see an, equi an equivalent improvement uh, in performance, uh, while we do get a lot more improvement from actually encoding uh, certain types of knowledge uh, inside the language model using this common sense transformers uh, approach. Uh, now, granted, you know, if you were to scale this model even much larger to something like GPT-3, uh, you might actually, you know, see a, a, a larger improvement in performance, uh, though I do think that GPT-3 has been run in a few shot manner on social IQA, and it does not actually do anywhere close to what supervision on the full supervision on the task gets. Um, and just to, to, to kind of show more qualitatively what the benefits of such an approach are, um, you know, we, we actually passed that example that I've shown earlier, you know, through the method. Um, and one thing we can also do just to be clear is actually evaluate how well the comment model that's been trained on the knowledge graph uh, evaluates these answer options in the first place. So don't go through, you know, this entire process of generating a dynamic graph, just evaluate it with respect to this knowledge model in the first place. And unfortunately, in this case, it gets the answer wrong and selects scared as the most likely result. Uh, while relieved is the correct answer. Uh, meanwhile, if you actually generate the graph, our approach of producing common sense inferences actually generates uh, inferences such as Kai wants to avoid getting into trouble. Uh, you know, Kai wants to be calm, you know, Kai stays calm. All of these are actually much more pragmatically associated uh, with others being potentially relieved as opposed to scared by the situation. And so when we actually evaluate the answer options with respect to these inferences, what we see is that relieved ends up being a much better scoring answer uh, one conditioned on these inferences as, as context. And so the inference algorithm is actually able to identify relieved as the correct option, you know, by aggregating the path scores in the first place. And finally, what's, what's interesting about these path scores is that, you know, they give us estimates of the contribution of each inference in the graph towards being able to select the answer. And that gives us an interpretable interface into how this graph was reasoned over to be able to make this prediction. Uh, so in summary, in this, in this section, I, you know, talk about a new algorithm for being able to dynamically construct uh, knowledge graphs for, for arbitrary situations from knowledge models, as long as that situation is describable using natural language, which, you know, when it comes to text understanding is typically the case. Uh, and then we talked about some inference algorithms for being able to, to aggregate reasoning hypotheses uh, over this situational graph. Um, but so, you know, dynamic graph construction and, you know, kind of imagination, ex explicit imagination of different scenarios um, is really just kind of one way of actually approaching this reasoning problem with, you know, both uh, language models and, and, and knowledge graph. Um, and one of the shortcomings of it is that it essentially treats the knowledge representation and the reasoning step as two separate problems that, you know, should be completed in series rather than potentially be done uh, in parallel. You know, so I, at this point, I do want to switch gears to talk about how we can design tighter neurosymbolic interfaces uh, between language models and knowledge graphs, uh, where the re representation of knowledge, you know, changes as the model reasons about the context and is it, you know, kept static. And so what I'll discuss in this part of the talk is from our recent work at NACL called uh, QAGNN, uh, which was a project that was led by uh, Michi Yasunaga, who's a PhD student at Stanford. Um, and uh, as a recap, we're actually still trying to solve the same problems as before uh, regarding neural and symbolic systems, uh, mainly that neural systems are prone to finding these, these minimally informative shortcuts to arrive at the, at the correct answer. Uh, you know, just to, to reiterate this point, if we take this example from the, the common sense QA data set, uh, if it's not used for hair, a round brush is an example of what. You know, I, I feel pretty confident in saying that a language model that's been trained on hundreds of gigabytes of text has probably learned quite a bit of knowledge about you know, these different entities uh, to be able to answer this, this question correctly. So it, you know, it should be able to, to do it. Uh, in fact, actually, if we look at what a common sense knowledge model such as Comet thinks about you know, these types of round brushes, it actually can show us that it has the knowledge to be able to answer this, this question correctly. It knows these concepts. 
you know, it thinks that knowledge, uh, sorry, that round brushes can be used to, to, to paint a picture, to paint a portrait. Um, and yet, if we fine tune this model on the common sense QA training set and then ask it to answer this question, it does get it wrong. So even though the model does have the necessary knowledge in the first place uh, to be able to get this right, it learns to rely on spurious signals. So the reasoning process that it learns from these other examples uh, doesn't actually allow it to generalize well to the reasoning process that's needed for this particular example. Uh, so it can't learn to reason to answer this question correctly. Uh, so, you know, we still have the same problems with, with, with neural reasoning. Uh, meanwhile, you know, while symbolic structures, you know, you know, could provide us the interpretability and, and you know, the set of reasoning steps to actually be able to, to, to answer this question correctly, you know, it's going to do so at the expense of, of expressivity. We're going to be limited to the hypotheses that we can, that are either already enumerated explicitly uh, or that we can enumerate uh, explicitly before we start doing reasoning. And that doesn't necessarily work in open worlds where you're actually forced to adapt your reasoning process once you start getting new information and aggregating new knowledge. Uh, so in our work, we were really looking to answer this question of how we could design new interfaces between language models and knowledge graphs that enable both structured reasoning to, to ground neural models, uh, but also the type of contextual reasoning that's, that's, that's necessary to capture the nuance of open worlds. Um, and so we designed this new method uh, called QAGNN that uses both language models and, and knowledge graphs and actually treats them as equal participants uh, in the reasoning uh, process. So not one after the other, uh, but together jointly. Uh, and so to, you know, to, to actually initialize this system, uh, we take the output of what we would normally use to answer questions from the language models. Uh, so you know, this, this, this kind of output representation that we get from passing the question through the language model, uh, except now what we're going to do is that instead of using it to make a prediction as we did before, we're actually going to use it to initialize a new language node uh, in this knowledge graph, which we can connect to all of the entities from our, from our ex extracted subgraph for this particular context uh, using special relations that identify what part of the context, uh, the question or the answer that node actually represents in the language representation. And what connecting this representation of language to the graph as an initial node does is it allows us to construct this, this joint graph representation that brings uh, language and knowledge together in a shared semantic space uh, with, with roughly equal importance. Um, and then, you know, once we have this, this, this new joint knowledge graph structure, uh, we can represent it using a, a graph neural network. So a typical neural network model that's used for, 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 for representing graphs. And so here, uh, each node in the graph is going to be represented as a vector of features and propagate messages between nodes over the course of, mu uh, of multiple layers, uh, which is going to simulate the reasoning that's needed to answer these questions. But unlike in the case of language models, uh, which you know, do this in a completely unstructured way, here, this is only going to happen along the predefined structure that we initialized from the KG. So the structure of the graph neural network is really the structure of the knowledge graph that we initially have. So we can only propagate information uh, along you know, the particular edges that are in this graph in the first place. And so to, to be a bit more explicit, you know, given a context that's written in natural language, we're going to retrieve a subgraph of relevant entities to that context and compute initial node features uh, for each of the nodes in this graph. Um, simultaneously, we're going to compute a language encoding of this context, so pass this question and the set of answers through a language model, and then combine the node features of the graph and the language representation of the context into this shared structure. And then we're going to mix the knowledge that's gained from both modalities over the course of multiple layers of message passing uh, in this graph uh, neural network. Um, so, uh, you know, in order to do this, we define a new message passing algorithm that's based off graph attention uh, to be able to spread information between the nodes in the graph uh, to, our, to our language representation and also to other nodes in the graph. Uh, so in the setting uh, at each layer of the graph neural network, we're going to compute a message that each node passes to its, to its neighbors. Uh, so to do this, each node assigns uh, attention weights to the messages it receives from its neighbors so that its new node representation at the next layer uh, represents that information that it's able to aggregate from its surrounding nodes. And so the, me the messages for, for each node are a function of its current representation, uh, a, a node type feature, and a relation type feature. Uh, and this pretty much just you know, says a bit about what type of node this is in the graph, whether it corresponds to an answer entity, a question entity, some other, you know, other entity in the extracted subgraph. And the relation uh, type feature just uh, you know, gives information about what is, what is the relation along the edge that this message is being propagated along. <clears throat> 
Uh, and finally, once we are compute a message for each node individually, um, you know, the attention over the different messages that is received by, 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 by a particular node from the nodes in its neighborhood uh, is really kind of a, a classical scale dot product attention uh, where the query and key vectors are, are functions of the node type uh, of the node type of the, of the receiving node and the relation type uh, between the two edges. Um, and then, you know, once we're, we've actually managed to um, uh, actually, you know, uh, do this type of, uh, of interactive reasoning between language and knowledge across multiple layers, uh, we can integrate them into a larger model for the particular task we're trying to solve. Uh, so in this case, you know, this, this joint language and knowledge reasoning design allows us to answer complex questions about these, these kind of common sense situations uh, as the one that I talked about before. Um, and so to, to, to kind of summarize what, what, the, what the contribution uh, in, this, in, in this project was, is that it really, you know, it, uh, captures the fact that symbolic structures do provide knowledge in a format that makes reasoning capabilities easier to learn for neural models. You know, if you just provide a language context to a language model, it really has no way of learning what is the best way to reason about the situation to get the correct answer. All it can do is, you know, try to learn statistically how often that correct answer correlates with the different features that are provided uh, as inputs. You know, knowledge graphs change that and that it actually provides specific relationships amongst the entities that should be used to actually arrive at this answer. However, the problem with knowledge graphs is that they can lose a lot of context uh, about these original situations that you really want to be maintained during reasoning. Uh, such as, you know, perhaps, you know, negating particular clauses in the situation or introducing hedge terms to indicate levels of uncertainty. Uh, and so, you know, what QAGNN does is that it initializes the context as an additional node in the graph, you know, that allows this nuance to actually be part of the graphical structure and allows interaction between both of these modalities. Uh, and so to evaluate how well this works, we tested on two popular QA datasets, uh, Common Sense QA and Open Book QA. Uh, which you know reflect reasoning about you know general open world knowledge, um, and what we see is that we get significant improvements on both of these data sets. Uh, you um, both uh, methods that only use language models to approach these tasks, such as Roberta or Aristo Roberta, uh, but then also other methods that integrate graph structure uh, and language models, uh, but that don't necessarily have this joint graph structure over both modalities that allows this interaction. Uh, for, for, for both, you know, getting knowledge to ground language, but also getting, uh, you know, the, the, the nuance of the context to be able to affect the knowledge representations that are formulated over the course of the reasoning steps. Um, you know, one last thing I do want to focus on in the setting that I, that I think is quite cool about this method is that this, this architecture also allows us to track how differences in the way we express, you know, reasoning through language induces different graph propagation schemes across time. Uh, so here, for example, if the model is given, you know, this question, if not used for hair, a round brush is an example of what, uh, and the two answers, a hairbrush or art, uh, art supplies, we can actually look at the starting attention given to each node in the graph by the context node, uh, so the purple triangles uh, here in the, in the leftmost graph, and see that it focuses equally on the hair and the round brush as context entities. By the last layer of the graph neural network, though, we can see that this has switched to focus on the round brush, which is where the focus should be to answer this question correctly. And importantly, the round brush node, while originally you know, weighting you know, the hairbrush and painting equally, uh, is now attending a lot more to the painting node than the hairbrush one, which is the right focus as well in order to reason correctly about the situation. Um, meanwhile, though, what's interesting is that if we were to flip the negation and remove the knot from the context to get, if it is used for hair, a round brush as an example of what, you know, obviously there's kind of a clear, you know, bias here that it should be able to predict hairbrush correctly because hair and hairbrush are there. Uh, what we actually see in our model is that by the final layer, you know, the GNN actually flips the attention of the context node to focus more on hair in the first place, uh, which is what we want uh, in this case. Uh, Robert actually gets this correct this time because it, you know, was able to, 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 you know, get that bias in the first place, while in the case of the negation, it had it wrong. Um, but finally, what's also interesting is that if we switch the word hair in the context art, but keep in the, the negation as before, we see that the context node still focuses on the round brush, which is, you know, kind of what uh, we want it to do rather than art. Um, but the round brush's attention is now completely focused on the hairbrush here rather than painting. Uh, so in essence, changes in the language of the model reads is being reflected by the nodes in this graph neural network. Um, in, in terms of how they actually propagate information amongst each other, uh, which allows us to qualitatively examine, examine how reasoning steps are being reflected by this model 
uh, even though you know we, we don't necessarily have the same kind of explicit reasoning that is typically done in more symbolic uh, reasoning schemes. Um, so to conclude this part of the talk, you know, I just kind of want to reiterate that one of the biggest issues with neural reasoning methods is that they actually tend to shortcut, you know, the types of reasoning abilities they need to learn by uh, instead learning to represent easy statistical patterns that allow them to reach the correct answer. You know, meanwhile, one of the, the, the issues that consistently pops up with symbolic inference is that while they're incredibly precise reasoners, they can actually underpower the type of reasoning we want to be able to do in open worlds by losing the contextual nuance of the situations that we actually give to them in order to fit them into the scheme, in order to you know fit them into the schemas that they need uh, to be able to understand these situations. Um, and so, in this work, you know, we, we were really interested in doing is being able to design effective scaffolds for neural reasoning by using symbolic uh, representations uh, as a component inside the neural network that we use to actually accomplish the reasoning. Um, one of the issues, though, with QAGNN uh, and its and its strong joint language and knowledge representation, though, is that there's there's this kind of key uh, methodological weakness, um, which is you know perhaps quite relevant to this workshop on hybrid and compositional reasoning, um, which is that when we initialize the context node in the graph neural network uh, with this representation of the uh, of the language context, it really serves as a final compression of that language context. You know, so from that point on, the language representation is only ever updated by message passing from the knowledge graph, which means that the model never reevaluates the way it originally represented that language after receiving knowledge from the KG. And this is, this is kind of a problem from a conceptual standpoint, because as our understanding of a context changes based off the integration of new knowledge, uh, our model needs to be able to re-encode the language from that situation in a fine grained detail that reflects these, this, this new information. Uh, and while this might not seem like a huge you know, deal from the example of, uh, that I just gave, you know, imagine a more complex contextual situation such as what is unlikely to get bugs on its windshield due to bugs is an ability to reach it when it is moving. You know, so that's, you know, with, with this more complex situation, that single vector encoding of language at the start needs to be able to capture an incredible amount of contextual nuance. And, and linguistic nuance, which is something that we as humans are easily able to do. You know, it needs to be able to understand, you know, that it's it's related to unlikely to get bugs. You know, there's this professional prepositional phrase of on its windshield. Something is due to a bug's inability or incapability uh, to reach something, and it's when that thing is moving. So we're talking about hedge terms, negation terms, you know, multiple prepositional modifiers. This 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 scenario is really quite compositional in the way that it presents its context. Um, and so as the model gets information from the knowledge graph, you know, you know, that is related to this context and starts reasoning about, you know, the relationships between those entities, it should be able to modify the way that it has composed these pieces of information in the first place when parsing that context uh, to be able to better attend to relevant information of the KG as it moves towards future reasoning layers. And so in this case, you know, as an example, an ideal model might learn to re-encode the context in downway information such as on its windshield, since you know, at best, that's not particularly informative because all of the answer options in this scenario have a windshield. And at worst, it provides an adversarial bias if that fact is only annotated for some of these vehicles in the knowledge graph. Uh, so clearly to be able to construct adequate compositional representations of language, we need to be able to modify the compositions of, of, those, of those components as new knowledge about the context is received from the knowledge graph and propagated uh, over the course of our reasoning stages. Um, and so this was really the, 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 the focus uh, that we, uh, of the problem that we set out to solve in our, in our kind of new fresh off the press, press work, uh, Greece LM, Graph Reasoning Enhanced Language Models, uh, which was led by a Stanford PhD student, Shakun Zhang, and which should be on archive uh, in the next few days. Um, and so I'll spare you the motivation, you know, beyond what I've already talked about, because it's, it's kind of very similar to, to, Antoine, to what we've sorry, been trying to do. Would you like, Antoine, would you like yeah. to conclude in a couple of minutes because we're running out of time? Uh, sure. Uh, yeah, I thought I still had 20 minutes or so. Mm, okay, sure. let me say, sorry about that. Continue, okay. please. Um, and so, um, yeah, so, you know, this is, this is kind of the last part, but, you know, the idea really is that we designed a new neural architecture that's based on two central ideas. Uh, first, that, you know, we do want each of these modalities to, to individually mix. Uh, so that language representations can adequately learn to encode the context in a way that is language specific, and that knowledge uh, representations can, can learn to propagate relationships amongst the different entities in the graph. 
But, uh, but second, we also want to at some point have these modalities mix uh, and interact so that each of them is influenced by the information provided by the other and that they can then take this information back to their separate modalities to reformulate the representations of those modality uh, specific uh, tokens or entities. Uh, so to take a look at this more closely, you know, our method stuff starts off very similar to QAGNN, where we retrieve a subgraph of knowledge for a particular language context. Uh, one thing to note at this point is that similar to QAGNN, there's this special node, which we call Antoine, an interaction sorry for, node. Antoine, sorry for interrupting you. Um, we originally planned for 45 minutes plus 15 minutes for QA. I understand that you might miss this email. So if you can conclude in the next five minutes so that we have five, six minutes for the QA session, that would be great. Okay, yeah, yeah. I, I, sorry I about that. that. I, it seems that you missed this email. Sorry about that. Yeah, I mean, sorry, it wasn't necessarily clear on on, on the website. Okay, sure. Um, anyway, we can we can we can move uh, fast here. Uh, but the general idea is that you know once you get uh, an initial language pre-encoding, as well as this you know same kind of joint knowledge graph structure, you can pass them to these new types of of Greece LM layers, uh, which kind of look like the following. Uh, first, you know the the representation of both modalities, tokens for language and entities for for KGs, are input to layers that are that are individual to their modality. Uh, so in the case of language, it's, it's another language model layer. In the case of, of knowledge, it's passed through this GNN layer as before. Um, but then, you know, uh, once we've actually, uh, you know, mixed each modality's representations individually with each other, uh, we can take the representations of the interaction tokens uh, and pass them through uh, some type of modality interaction layer that further mixes these representations uh, only amongst each other this time, as opposed to, to individually as before. Uh, and then these newly uh, mixed representations of the interaction components, the interaction node and the interaction token can be returned to their separate uh, modality structures. And so over the, and, and we can repeat this process for multiple layers. So here you see that once we add a Grease LM layer on top of the initial one, uh, the interaction nodes for, for each modality are now going to, to, to share information with the other representation of their modality. And so, uh, you know, over the course of multiple layers, information is going to propagate uh, between you know the knowledge modality and the language modality, uh, and then you know these individual modalities will be able to mix you know this new information amongst each other, uh, and that allows both uh, you know you know both this idea of, of keeping separate representations of language and knowledge, since you know ultimately these are different modalities that should interact with their specific components in different ways, but also allows them to share information with each other, uh, such that you know both of them is, is grounded by the other. Uh, and then finally, as in QAGNN, we can you know kind of use these 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 different output representations of different parts of this pipeline uh, to, to to pool them to to make some type uh, of prediction. Um, and and in essence, what this approach allows us to do is to have this sustained interaction between modalities uh, while uh, while initializing these modality specific parameters uh, to govern the the, the propagation of information within uh, these modalities. So so language is able to to mix with language in a different way knowledge mixes with knowledge, but then you have this bottleneck that kind of composes uh, these, these representations together. And so we tested these, uh, this method on the same benchmarks as before, Common Sense QA and Open Book QA, uh, as well as a, a medical question answering data set to see whether our method could perform uh, you know, well, even though it was originally designed for common sense, whether it could operate in a completely different world space and with you know, much uh, longer context. So in case I hadn't convinced you that it's essential to be able to change the representation of language in a, in a compositional manner, uh, hopefully this type of context gets it across. Uh, and finally, you know, the main takeaways are twofold. First is that the Greece LM does, does better than you know, the same types of baselines we had before, uh, this time including QAGNN. So these multiple layers of interaction between both modalities uh, turns out to be helpful in terms of general performance. But second, what was perhaps most interesting was that much of these improvements come on questions that we would describe as being more contextually complex, uh, which is what we wanted to do in the first place. Uh, so for example, as a, as a proxy for question complexity, we counted up the number of prepositional phrases in each question, hypothesizing that these you know, correspond to modifiers of the original situation we're trying to understand. Uh, you know, so for example, uh, a question such as, where is a shelf likely to be hidden behind a door has two prepositional phrases and is a bit more complex than what are cats often known for. And then we bin the performance across the number of these phrases. Uh, and we you know, find that for questions with fewer prepositional phrases, there's not much of an advantage to our method over something like QAGNN. Uh, but as we increase the question complexity, you know, Grease LM is, is able to, to kind of get uh, a lot of benefits over previous methods. 
Uh, and we see similar patterns play out for other versions of question complexity, such as negation terms uh, and, uh, and hedge terms. Um, so I guess, you know, uh, to a few concluding thoughts based on what I, I talked uh, today. Uh, the first is that reasoning really depends on the interface between the knowledge representation and language processing tasks that we define. If we really want expressive reasoning systems, uh, it's kind of difficult to kind of have these, these cascaded systems where we first define the knowledge representation kind of very explicitly and then use, um, and then use represent and then only use reasoning schemes that don't adjust that representation in the first place. When we do this and, and kind of reason by graph constructions in the first example, we can get very uh, interpretable pathways to conclusions, but it ultimately ends up being a pretty a pretty rigid and brittle scheme uh, that's less adaptable uh, as as we actually kind of you know need to aggregate new information about these scenarios. Um, meanwhile, when we use something like a graph neural network. You know, we actually sacrifice some of that interpretability. We're still able to maintain some of it in kind of the way these attention functions propagate, but at least we have the expressivity of learned functions that can update the representations of the different pieces of knowledge that we have as we proceed to propagate information forward and reason over those concepts. Um, but more broadly, you know, I, I kind of do want to, you know, bring, uh, you know, you know, kind of get us thinking about what it actually means to reason and how this should motivate the way in which we design systems for this purpose. Um, you know, so, for, you know, for example, one thing I like to think about is that reasoning is often tightly coupled with, with explanation. It's, it's really, it's a tool for justification. A lot of the times when we as humans make decisions, we're not actually kind of, you know, reasoning through every possible inference that we make in order to arrive at the rest conclusion. We're actually kind of, you know, relying more on intuition to arrive at a decision, but we are able to communicate the reasoning process that would underlie that intuition to another human being uh, if, if, if asked about it. And so language is really the way that we communicate reasoning through explanation to other people. And really there, once we actually start being descriptive about it, um, you know, nuances and how we make those descriptions really play a, 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 a huge role in the perceived strength of the reasoning that we use to justify our own intuitions and decisions. And so really the focus of the work that I've described today is, is, is about how we can actually improve the scaffolds for neural reasonings, which tend to approximate intuition a bit better than classical symbolic systems using these tighter integrations of language and knowledge uh, where you know, language can provide us with the contextualization to, to model the nuance of the world in which we're operating while knowledge can provide the grounding. So the ways that we can reason over these concepts uh, in order to arrive uh, at these conclusions. Um, so thanks for taking the time to listen. And uh, you know, I hope I'm, I'm close to the, to the time that was originally allocated. Uh, and thanks to, to the great organizers for having me here. Um, I also want to thank these, these fantastic folks that, that worked with me uh, on these projects, and uh, I look forward to, to any questions that you might have. Uh, and if you're curious about the works that I described today, uh, here's some references uh, that uh, are uh, mentioned and will be on the, on the published videos so that you can come back to it later. Thank you.